In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So I'd like to begin with just a few comments on how the lectionary is handling these this week and next week. This is in chapter 13. Next week, we're going to hear from Luke 14, verses 1 and 7 through 14. Now, you are right to wonder what happened to verses 2 through 6. Why did they get chopped off? And if they just wanted to tell the story of verses 7 through 14, why did they include that first verse? That you'll find out about next week. (laughs) But verses 2 through 6 are really important. But in essence, they tell the same story as today's reading. The major difference being that today's miracle involved a crippled woman, and the beginning of chapter 14 tells almost the same story with a diseased man. Now, in both cases, the core message has key elements which are the same. God's healing grace is sacred and holy, and not limited by the day of the week. Now, I'm not faulting the lectionary for cutting the story of the man with dropsy in order to get to the lesson on humility and hospitality. I don't want to have to preach an identical sermon two weeks in a row any more than you want to hear one, right? So it makes sense to eliminate it. But the thing that goes missing when you leave out those verses is why Luke writes parallel stories. In fact, why did Jesus teach parallel stories? You know, for example, there's the parable of the persistent male friend and also the persistent widow. The parable of the shepherd finding the lost sheep is a man. And the woman finding the lost coin immediately follows. Jesus wanted to make it very clear that the good news was for all people. And that was not lost on Luke. It is a reminder to us that both Jesus and Luke were addressing mixed crowds in an era when to do so was unusual. And a little bonus takeaway for us that I think is really important is that when people have been recently included, then or now, whether due to their race, their ethnicity, or their gender, or anything else, it is not their work or responsibility to dig a place for themselves. It is our work to move over and make room for them seven days of the week. So, I don't know if you've heard of the heavenly kingdom being thought of as the economy of God. Now, when theologians use that, they're specifically talking about the Trinity and how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit interact with one another and how they are bond bound by the love of God that is the coin of the realm and it is the coin of the economy of God. In Christ, we are drawn into the economy of God. And it is quite upside down from the economy of man, which we live in every day of the week. You've probably heard of people talking about the upside down kingdom of God, where shame becomes glory, the least are the greatest, and the last will be first. That's how God works. The stories and parables are Jesus' way of helping us to understand. He's kind of a cosmic economics professor, you could say, explaining things in such a way that when we hear the story, it makes sense in the moment. Oh, I get it now. But then we go back out into the world and we forget the essentials, which is why we read scripture over and over again. The more time you spend with scripture, the better you will feel, I promise. More and more you will begin to see that you live in God's world, And more and more, you will begin to see others as they truly are, beloved children doing their best in a world that is simultaneously broken and beautiful. When we begin to have eyes at sea, even if it is just to take the time to notice the people around us and just return a smile at the grocery store, we are participants in the economy of God. I bring this to your attention because it is a theme this week and very strongly a theme next week. These are kind of almost a mini-series. 
So let's, let's look at the details of today's story. This unnamed woman comes in. Jesus calls out to her. She comes near. He touches her. It's probably quite scandalous, as we can assume that her ailments have kept her on the outside of society. And instantly, she stands tall and praises God for his goodness towards her. Then, Jesus turns to the crowd. This is the part where we make room for the new one. <laughs> she doesn't have to turn to the crowd and find her way in. This is Jesus' work and our work. So he turns to them, where the religious leaders are haranguing them. Over and over, they're saying, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But this is such a false notion of work. How is it work to lift others up and to see them in their full stature as brothers and sisters? Using language everyone will understand, Jesus, remember the cosmic economics professor, explains it to them. He says, you care for your animals on the Sabbath. How much more so should you care for this woman, this daughter of Abraham? Now, he doesn't use words lightly. And this title is so key for us to understand. Other women whom he has healed have names, right? We got like a million Marys, right? <laughs> Martha, a few more. But by leaving her unnamed, she becomes an every woman. Jesus is not comparing the woman to an animal, which is another thing that's very important to understand. In his day, it was common to lecture or to argue from lesser to greater. This woman is priceless. Your animal is not. So, your treatment of her should be magnitudes greater than that of your oxen. And he goes on. Here's some economics. Your livelihood depends on the health of your oxen in this world. Your livelihood in the kingdom of God depends that much more on your treatment of every woman. Now, Jesus doesn't mince words. And so when he called her daughter of Abraham... That was his intention, to indicate that in her is the status of all women, which has been stooped then and still to this day. Women struggle to be given equal status and to stand as tall as men. So it is no wonder that the crowd rejoices. Come in there. <laughs> You're probably pretty glad. It is an external ailment placed on women, binding them and cursing them, sometimes for their entire lives. To be healed is to be restored to the thing you were meant to be, to be the person God imagined when he dreamed you into being. Salvation is restoration, as we are saved from a broken world that tells us all kinds of things about ourselves that just are not true. Now, Jesus is displaying his divinity in her healing. And he is displaying his humanity in the restoration of her dignity. This is good news, because we're not divine. But as adopted children of God, we are charged with the lifting up of the lowly, not just when it is convenient for us, but seven days of the week. We may not have the, the power to heal as Christ heals. I may not be able to touch you and heal you in the moment, but I can look in your eyes and restore your dignity. Amen. Amen.